the wonderful love of Jesus. I had two young men and two young preachers in my office this past week. And what a testimony they are. It was a great joy to have Nikki Cruz and Sonny Argonzoni in my office. Nikki Cruz was the Mama gang leader, gave his heart to Christ. He'd been saved 30 years in preaching. He was the, uh, one of the key characters in the Cross and Switchblade uh, story. And Sonny Argonzoni was the first drug addict uh, we reached for the Lord when we came to New York City three years ago. Nicky was on his way to a crusade in London. He travels all over the world preaching to thousands, and I'll never forget how the love of Jesus touched him. I, every time I go past Fort Greene Projects here in Brooklyn, I get a lump in my throat. I was 115 pounds, 28 years old. But feeling the love of Jesus just rushing to me that Jesus had for drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. And I walked into this city and I uh, drove in rather 1957 green Chevrolet, slept in the car. I sure wouldn't do it now knowing what I know. But I slept in the car and put newspapers against the window. Found out the worst gang in New York City at that time. In fact, they, they had over, over uh, 300 gangs listed by youth department at that time, 1958. And I went down to, to find the Mile Miles. And they were staying against the fence in their red jackets with big double M's. 28 kids had been murdered in 1958 in gang fights. And I remember going up to one young man. His name was Israel the president of the gang, and he was very kind, shook hands, and uh, said, hey, preach, you're okay. I, he had listened to me preach for about five minutes. I went to shake hands with Nicky Cruz, and he spit on me, slapped my face, and said, go to hell. I'll never forget that stinging on my face. And I, all I could burn out, I, I don't think I did it in anger, Nicky, Jesus loves you. And walked away thinking, Lord, I know you love him, but I don't know if you can save him. He's the hardest. I don't like to be slapped. I like to be spit on. Nikki Cruz could get that out. It was like a stuck record, broken record. All night long, Nikki, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He hated police. He hated everybody else. Some of you have heard his testimony. Nikki, Jesus loves you. And folks, to sit in my office and look at that young man on his way to London, having reached thousands and thousands around the world, five girls... Five children, I think uh, two or three in Bible school, and all called to some kind of ministry. Nikki going on with the Lord. All I can say is, Jesus, your love finds them. Your love is everlasting. Nikki never told me, never knew what the love of Jesus was and what Christ had done for him until his little girl, his first little child, came to hear him in one of his crusades. And he was telling the story of all the terrible things he did and went home and she wouldn't talk to him. He said, what's the matter, honey? She said, you're a bad man. I don't want to talk to you. That's not my daddy. <laughs> and it hurt him. He didn't realize till then uh, how God had changed, how the love of Jesus had manifested itself so much in his life. Sonny Argonzoni, I met 28 years, or, or 30 years ago, down in Brooklyn under the elevated train right off the Williamsburg Bridge. And I, I went up to him in front of a pizza shop. And I, he was a drug addict just waiting for his contact. Found out his name, I said, Sonny, Jesus loves you. He said, man, get off the block. My mom's one of those hallelujah people. But she's a, one of those tongue-talking hallelujahs. You sound like one. I said, yes, I am. But I, I remember saying, Sonny, Jesus sent me down here because he loves you. Sonny had been in and out of jail, in and out of prison. His mother would see him dirty, filthy, and ragged on the street and say, Sonny, please, just come home, change your shirt, let me gift you a clean meal. He said, Mama, go home. Didn't want anything to do with, with family, had no thoughts of God, been shot at, in and out of prison. But I never forget the day. He came remembering that invitation to come to the sun. Remember that, that, just that one statement. Nikki, or rather Sonny, Jesus loves you. His love will find you. And the love of Jesus found Sonny when he came in and heard Nikki preach at our center down here in Brooklyn. And he thought that, he thought Nikki, while he was preaching, someone had gone to him and told him all about him because Nikki was preaching his life. And Sonny sunk down in his seat because he heard his whole story being told. And Nicky Cruz goes over to Sonny, lays hands on him and said, God, save him and call him to preach. And Sonny thought, me, preach? 
a drug addict, a killer at heart. Oh, but folks, I set my office this past week. Sonny Argonzoni is not only a pastor, he's a bishop of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They've got churches all over America. In fact, he was in Philadelphia helping set up another one of their churches. In their, in their conferences, they have three, 4,000, all of them converted drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. Sonny Argonzoni is a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the love of Christ was manifested in him. Now see, there are many of you here tonight. You know what I'm talking about because up, up here you fellows from, drug, from, from the drug life, alcoholics, many of you, not even in Teen Challenge, maybe other programs. Some of you here may be in business. You were a drug addict, you were an alcoholic, you were drinking, you were lost, you were hopeless, but the love of Jesus Christ came to you. Manifested itself to you. How, how beautiful wasn't it, the love of Jesus, when you first heard of it? What a thrust of glory when you realized that in spite of what you'd done, Jesus loved you. And you rejoiced in that love. You went a long time just basking in that love. And then you started going around telling everybody how Jesus loved them. Some of you have been witnessing. You've been saved five years, ten years. But what's happened since then? Many of you have backslidden about the love of Jesus for yourself. Somehow along the line, you, you, you got the idea that because you have allowed a coldness or a failure into your life, that you can preach Jesus and his love to others, but you can't appropriate it to yourself. Now this is where I'm going with the message tonight. I want to talk about his love for you as a Christian. His love for you as a believer. And for me. You know, I was preaching a number of years ago in Harlem, in a street meeting, and I was going through a very difficult time in our ministry. Very, very difficult. Gwen had cancer. And in fact, I think this was her second cancer she had back in the hospital. And I had the burden of teen challenge and it was weighing heavy on me, traveling, trying to raise funds, trying to keep the whole thing afloat and centers, cities all over the country calling. And, and I was absolutely at the end of my rope at this particular time. I, I, and, and in my burden and in my struggle over, I, I got so burdened over needs, I went down to about 115 pounds. Skin and bone, it just, there was no joy because I was so burdened down by the needs of the city. And in that, I, I shut Gwen out. And in her pain, she, she, she couldn't stand being cut out from my life. It, it wasn't that, I don't, I don't think I was a bad husband or anything, but I didn't really bring her into the burden that was on my heart. I should have shared it with her. And we were going through a rather difficult time. And I remember, one day just losing my temper and going off for a street meeting and I felt so dirty and so unclean. Has that ever happened to you? Where, you know, you want God with all your heart, you love Him with everything that's in you, and, and you fast, you pray, you seek Him, but suddenly, there it is, just like a flood. It just comes and hits you and sweeps you off your feet. You lose your temper, you do something stupid, and you feel dirty and unclean and filthy. And I had to go up into Harlem, and I'm standing there in my pain, and I'm preaching my heart out. Jesus loves you. I don't care what you did. Drugs, alcohol, prostitute. Come on up. Jesus loves you. Give your heart to him. And after I preached this profound message, I thought how Jesus could love anybody on the streets. I'm standing there after the meeting in despair, watching drug addicts and alcoholics with our personal workers, drinking in the love of Jesus. And suddenly, in my despair, my head down, feeling so low, the Holy Spirit said to me, David, why don't you appropriate some of that love you've been preaching for yourself? Why don't you let me love you? What gives you the idea that you can just preach it and not practice it, not appropriate it to yourself? And friends, from that day to this, there are many times I've had to just step back and say, Jesus, I've been out preaching it. I tell the whole world that you can save body, anybody from anything. Now, Jesus, come and love me. Amen. Love me. I remember one time when uh, one of Gwen's last uh, times in the hospital. She was so wiped out. She, she had uh, lupus. And had, had about 30 pounds of water on her and, and was in the hospital. 
And she, she had said, David, this is enough. I can't. After all these operations of cancer, this is just too much. And she went in the hospital just at the end of her rope. And I went to a hotel room near the hospital. And I said, oh, God, when does this ever stop? Lord, I love you. I see there's no, I can't figure it out. It, 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 she can't go through much more pain. And, you know, I said, Lord, give me something. And, you know, it's not a good idea to just say, Lord, give me something and open your Bible. Because you know where it fell? It fell in Jeremiah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you, know what, you know what I did? I closed and said, no, Lord, not today. I, I'm hurting enough. And you know what the Lord whispered in my heart? David, just lay still let me love you. So help me the Holy Ghost brought Jesus his presence in that room, and he put his arms around me and began to love me. And I said, Jesus, now love Gwen. And, and then the Holy Spirit put his scriptures, uh, Psalms, so so what then? You know what said? He makes all wars to cease. I said, that's it. That's it. He's making all cease. I ran to the hospital. Gwen was dressed. He said, David, I'm healed. I'm getting out of here. Let's go home. I have victory. <laughs> this is the love. The absolute love of Jesus Christ being manifested. The Bible said the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You can't counsel other people that they, they are loved without appropriating that love for yourself. Now, there, there are some of you here that love Jesus dearly, but you're not persuaded that Jesus Christ loves you. You preach to others. You, you, you picture yourself, though, as... as having failed the Lord, and he's cast aside as a result of it. I want to speak directly to you tonight. I, I really believe God put this in my heart, and why I struggled so much with all the imps of hell to get through. But here's, I was laying on my face last night, and God began to speak clearly to me, to speak directly to those who be here tonight who felt that you've let the Lord down. You feel you've let the Lord down. You've not lived up to the standard you've heard preached in this pulpit or wherever it may be. Now, friends, if you've been coming to this church, we hold up a high standard. We preach a strong message of righteousness and holiness. And many of you feel that you can't live up to that, that you failed the Lord somehow. It's not that we've been putting a heavy trip on you. We're trying to preach what we believe is the standard of the Word of God. But in your striving to be more like Jesus, you've failed the Lord. You've sinned somehow. And you sit here this, after, this evening with failure in your life. You have tripped. You have fallen. Satan has bruised your heel. Now remember, that's what the scriptures, it, it, it was originally said, that the serpent will bruise your heel. And when serpent bruises your heel, does not mean you're damned or you're lost outside of the love of Jesus. He's bruised your heel. But there's healing for that. But now you're here tonight and you're living with guilt and condemnation. You can't see how Christ can still love you because deep in your heart you know you may have grieved the Holy Spirit and you, you somehow walk right into the devil's trap or you're still in the satanic snare. But I want you to know, friends, and listen closely, you and I were reconciled to God when we were still enemies. When we were out in sin, not even thinking of God, Jesus loved us. Let me read it to you. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, yet sinners, we weren't even thinking of him. When you were out there, do you remember when you were out there? Do you remember when you had no time for him? Do you remember those days? And the Lord said, even then I loved you. Even then you were reconciled to me if you would have only repented and come. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The Lord said, if I loved you when you were out there not even thinking about me, do I not love you now when you're going through a struggle? When your heart still loves me? Now, I'm not talking about those who have just put God aside. They've given themselves over to their sin. They don't want anything to do with God. They're not interested in repentance. I'm talking about Christians and others who have backslidden somehow. In, in fact, the closer you get to Jesus, the least thing will seem big to you in the sight, 
in your own eyes. You'll feel the grief of having grieved the Lord. Now, I don't have anything profound tonight, but I want to share you just a few things that the Holy Spirit's putting in my heart about His love. First of all, God wants us to be fully persuaded, fully persuaded that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. I want you to go. Let's go to Romans 8. Let's go to Romans 8. Faith chapter, verse 38. Beginning to read. Do you have it? Romans 8, 38. Oh, I love the word, don't you? For I am, this is Paul speaking, I am persuaded. I'm completely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Now that's the truth that the devil doesn't want us to be convinced of. He doesn't want you to hear that. He doesn't want you to know it. Because I want you to know something. If you can come, if you can get a hold of this truth, you can come through any trial. You can come through your temptation you're going through now in your trial. You can come through any failure and be more than a conqueror if you're fully persuaded that Jesus loves you. Look, look, look at verse 5. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You're conquered through the love of Jesus Christ for you. Look at me, folks. The cry of this book is be rooted and grounded in love that you may be able to endure. Yeah. You may be able to stand in a troubled time, rooted and grounded in love. Yeah. I'm afraid we're not rooted, we're not grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. Many of us, we're afraid to appropriate it. Philippians 1, 6, don't turn, says, being confident of this, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perfect it to the day of Jesus Christ. When you came to the Lord, now listen closely to me. You came to the Lord. He decided he'd not let you go. Listen to me now. You came to the Lord and it was known in heaven and hell and earth that Jesus paid for you with his own blood. And he put a stamp on you and he engraved you in the palm of his hand and he said, devil, this child belongs to me. Now, no matter what problem you're going through, no matter what failure you're at, if you'll confess it and repent, you'll come back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his precious love. He that's begun a good and work in you will perfect it through the day of Christ. You're not going to let the devil interrupt his work in you. Satan's lying to some of you right now. He's trying to tell you that Jesus has given up on you. He's telling you that Jesus is mad at you. That you're just wicked and evil. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never be holy. You'll never be clean. You can hit, hear, hear Brother Bob preach. You can hear me, hear Gary, hear one of the pastors preach. You say, I'll never, I can't measure up. There's no way I'm going to measure up. Everybody else is measuring up, but I'm not measuring up. Have you ever sat here thinking you're the only one going through problems, the only one having a problem? Anybody sitting here right now thinking you're the only one with failure in your life? You say, but what's, no, are you going to do it? Uh, one of those TV evangelist things on us? No, I'm not. I'm not standing here in any known failure in my life. But there are some of you sitting here now and the devil lying to you right now. He's saying, see, you tried and you can't make it. Bob did hit this so strong this morning. And here you sit, wondering if you should even go on. We've had people leave this church. They have absolutely quit on the Lord because they say, I can't make it. I can't. I, I will never measure up to what he wants. I want you to know that God's given you a word. You can take it right to the devil and you can throw it right at him just as Jesus did in the wilderness and the devil going to run. It's right there in the 8th chapter of Romans. Look at it. The 34th verse. 34th. Who is he that condemneth? Well, you know who that is, don't you? Were you condemned this afternoon before you came to church? Have you been sitting here doing the worship being condemned? We, we've got... We've got a condemner who stands before the throne of God, accuser of the brethren, trying to accuse you, saying, you'll never make it. But who is this that condemneth? 
It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You stand right up against Satan, and you can say this with everything in you. I refuse your condemnation and your lies. Jesus paid for my sins. I repent. Jesus loves me. I... I'm on his mind right now. In fact, devil, right now, when you're accusing me, he has me on his mind. He has me on his lips. He's talking to the Father about me right now. He's talking to the Father about me. This very moment, he's interceding before the Father. And you can tell the devil that. Glory be to God. And then you can quote him this scripture. I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You go back to him, you say, Father, I've sinned. I've had four children and I never kicked them out because they failed me. I took them aside. Sometimes I had to take them to the woodshed. Sometimes I had to spank the meanness out of them, but all along they were my children and I loved them and the only reason I spanked them was for their own good. When did Jesus throw you out? Tell me. When did he write a bill of a divorce and say, I divorce you, go on out on your own? When did he do it? You can't tell me when he did that. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you to the end. I'm going through you with your troubles. I'm going through your trial. Hold fast. Now notice a very interesting verse, Romans 8.35. Look at it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, who is a person, isn't that? And you know who that is. That's Satan. But then look. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Now, those are things. That's not a who. Those are things. Who is it that brings these things on us? Satan himself trying to bring all these things to rob us of the love of God. But I notice, look down in verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. Now, to separate us, who shall separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? That word separation is to isolate. In other words, to make you feel like an island of rejection. That you're not loved. And I'll tell you what the devil does. He'll first try to strip you of love of those around you. He'll try to interfere in the love of your family. Interfere in the love of your friends. And try to isolate you. In fact, the separation means to put a great gulf between it and isolate it as an island. Some of you are sitting here right now knowing what that means. You have felt rejection. You have felt isolated. And you, 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 feel, look, you feel just what they felt in Israel. It says, but Zion has said, the Lord hath forsaken us. And my Lord hath forsaken, forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her own womb. Yea, they may forget, yet I'll not forget you. Behold, I've graven you on the palm of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. And then in Hosea it says, I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Friends, God wants to heal every backslider here tonight. He wants to offer you his love and to heal that backsliding of your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit has really been putting me under conviction about the danger of presenting Jesus as a hard man. Do you remember that parable? There were three servants that were given talents. One was given ten, one was given five, and one was given one talent. And the man who had the one talent went and hid it in the earth. And one day the master comes and calls him to account. And he said, I, I want what I gave you. I want my return. And you know what he said? Master, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. And I was afraid, and I went and I hid my talent. And I was on my face before God. The Lord was saying, David, there's something you're not hearing, you're not seeing yet. And I would tell you, I don't believe you can be a holiness preacher of any kind. You can't be a preacher of righteousness unless you're teachable. And I'm telling you now, God's telling me I've got a lot to learn. And I confess it before you here now, and I'm not trying to be sentimental or put attention on myself. But God began to say, there's so much yet I've got to learn before I can be a shepherd to, this, to the sheep here even. All of us as pastors are, are open that God would teach us. But I got to thinking, Lord was showing me, what, what kind of teacher did this man have? The other two served the Lord with joy. 
They had no problem. They made their investment. It was a glorious experience. But this man comes and he said, boy, you're hard. And he was afraid and he hid his talent. Who was his teacher? What kind of message did he sit under that made him see Jesus as hard? Because Jesus is the master here. Brother Bob had to, he, he felt the same grief that I felt one time when, when some people that sat under his teaching had, had gone to a pastor and tried to correct him as if, you know, they knew it all now because they'd come into a holiness message. And Bob was alarmed and he got on the phone and he says, tell me, did my preaching produce that in you? And there, there was terror in Bob and, and my own heart. Are, are, are we going to preach a message that would produce that kind of thing? Are they misjudging what is being said? And I got to thinking, Lord, what kind of a, a pastor, what kind of a teacher, what kind of a message was he sitting under that he perceives Jesus as a hard man? A Friday night, a young pastor met me back. I don't know if he's here tonight or not. And tears in his eyes, visiting from another state. And he said, Brother Dave, I've been preaching holiness in my church, and I preach it hard. And he said, the people are not receiving it, and they're leaving left and right. But I can't compromise on my message. And I felt pain in my heart, because all over the country now, there, there, there's a message of holiness coming forth. There's a message of righteousness. But folks, too many are preaching it as hardness. They're not presenting Jesus in fullness. I remember something Bob told me that changed my life. He said, David, when we preach holiness, we must never veil Christ. We must never, never veil the mercy of Jesus Christ. But you see, I, I don't want to be that hard man, or, or that man that preaches a message, that pictures Jesus only as a hard man, because that produces fear, and fear has torment, and then people go and hide, because they feel they can't make it. I don't want to be one of those... Preach, you know, there are times when I, when I have to preach a strong message, a prophetic message especially. I know that there are some people that are out there that they're just, they, they want to say, yeah, preach it, brother Dave. Get it. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. It's almost like a cheering section. Hit it. And sometimes, past, I know there have been times I've been carried up in it. I confessed to Bob today about a time down in Georgia. I was preaching at a camp meeting two years ago. And I, on that campground, I saw these great big satellite dishes. And you know my hatred for television. The superintendent of the movement there was great big, biggest dish I ever saw. And I'll tell you what, I got up there in that pulpit, and boy, I skinned them alive. By the way, the Lord doesn't want hides. He wants souls. You know, skinning. I'll tell you what, I thundered, and I, uh, ever since I felt the pain for what I did, and later some pastors said, boy, you are hard, Brother Dave. But you know, there were some people in there just fed something and then they wanted to hit it. They wanted hard, hard, hard. Now I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to compromise on my message. I'm going to preach it. But there have been evangelists, you know, that have preached a hard message and you were there watching either on television or some. Yeah, there. Give it to them. That's right. And he's, they'll say, I'll not compromise. I'm going to preach and tell it like it is. But I've been hearing the Holy Spirit say to me, David, how are you presenting me to the sheep? Are you showing them my mercy and my love and my long-suffering along with my hatred for sin? Are you making them afraid, so afraid that they'll hide? And I want the Lord to help me preach holiness stronger than I've ever preached it, but I want to preach it with brokenness. I want to be like Paul who said, I came to you like in the tenderness of a nurse. I'm going to read it to you. Paul said, but we were gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but our, also our very souls, because you were dear to us. I confess to you, I've never known that. I'm beginning to know it. I've never passed. I've been an evangelist. And I've thundered all over the world. I don't think I know what it's like to be a nurse, to look out over a congregation of people living in a wicked city, hurting, carry all kinds of burdens and garbage from your past. And I want to, I want to see you walk in holiness. And all the past, we want to see you walk in holiness so much. 
Now, I, I can't speak for Bob. I know these men. Bob has a tender heart. Gary has a tender heart. I need this. I need to have that gentleness as a nurse, cherish of the children, not trying to spank them because there's a sickness, there's a disease, there's sin. And Paul is saying, I came to you people. My dear sheep is a nurse, cherishing her children. So being affectionate, desirous of you, we're willing to impart to you not just the gospel only, but our very souls because you're dear to us. Paul then added, we exhorted and we comforted and charged every one of you as a father to charge his children. No wonder Paul's message of holiness was received. It wasn't rejected. People didn't walk out here. Because he said, when you received this word of God which you heard of us, you received it. Not as word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. I told this young preacher what I want to tell every preacher of righteousness and holiness in America. If you're going to be preaching a strong message, preach it through brokenness, preach it through tears. And folks, that's what I've asked God to do for this pulpit. You may have heard people say, Times Square Church, you go down there and you just get beat. No, you don't get beat here. You won't get beaten here. Because God's breaking this ministry. He's breaking the hearts of the pastors, telling us that we need to be like Paul. We need to share with you as precious children. Not trying to whip you. Not trying to drive you. But to go to the throne of God. Touch His righteousness. Touch His holiness. See a vision of Jesus so clear. And then come to you and say, here He is. In all of His love, He hates sin. And that's why we preach so strong about it. We feel His wrath against it. And we don't want you to be damned. We love you too much. But to do it as a nurse. To do it as a father with looking with love to His children. And I confess before a holy God, I've not had that. I've not had that. But I want it. Make Jesus, present Jesus in His fullness. Sometimes, we're like the man who was forgiven a great debt. Then we walk right out and choke somebody who's not living up to our standard. The Bible says of Jesus, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father is also merciful. That's Luke 6.35. Jesus is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father is also merciful. James said, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Now God's showing me. He's just pounding in me with love. He, he, he'd been speaking all week to me. So strong. How serious this matter is of how we present Jesus to the world. How we present Him. Paul said we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what that means? We represent Him. The only thing the world's going to see of Jesus is what we show it. What we show the world of Him. There, there's a down in Brazil, I think it's in Brasilia, there's a cathedral, and there's a, a one of those uh, glass windows, colored glass, leaded glass windows, and it's, it's, it's Jesus. You see all these people kneeling before him, and Jesus is standing with a great big club in his hand, ready to smite them. And that's the vision of Jesus. That's a perverted view of Jesus. And, and, and those people come there with that great fear of this man in heaven with a club over their head. God's word says he is very pitiful and of tender mercies. And he's saying if you're going to witness out in the street or you're going to counsel anybody, if you're going to talk to people about Jesus, you've got to be a faithful ambassador. You've got to represent me for my, who, who I really am. And what, what the word says, be, be ye all of one mind having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Be pitiful. Be courteous. First Peter 3.8 You know, much of the street preaching here in New York City is very discourteous. Very discourteous. It's confrontational. 
It's mean. Yes. Sometimes it's ugly. I, I, I would imagine we've got 10, 15 street preachers here tonight. But if you're a street preacher, if you're a witness, or you are a counselor, you've got to understand what the Holy Spirit's saying tonight. Be careful. This is an awesome responsibility. How you present Jesus. Are you presenting Him in His fullness? Are you just showing one side of Him? You know, uh, Steve and I were walking down 42nd Street a few weeks ago. And Steve was carrying a briefcase. And this street preacher, God bless his heart, up in the 42nd Street here in Broadway. He stopped. We, we, we just, I just stopped to listen. And he said, look at this. Two, me and Steve, two computer junkies. They got their computer with them. They're so hooked on computers. You know what's in that box? A microphone. This microphone I have right here. With a big box we carried it. Computer junkies. They're so wrapped up in the world. I mean, he scolded us. To hear that, dear brother, we were headed right down to hell. <laughs> Sliding right down on our computer. We, we were tempted to open the box. What, what, what are you telling them out there? You shaking an accusing finger in their face? And this Lord who is very pitiful of tender mercies, are you making him out to be a monster? Are you? I don't want to misrepresent Jesus anymore. Be ye also pitiful. Be courteous. Now, look, the Bible said those who sin must be rebuked before all. That's 1 Timothy 5.20. The Bible said we are to exhort and rebuke with all authority. Titus 2.15. Unruly mouths must be stopped. You've got to rebuke them sharply. Titus 1.13. But we're also commanded to rebuke with all long-suffering. Now, that word long-suffering means very lenient. Patient and understanding. You know what the scripture said? Street preachers, listen. Witnesses, listen. Counselors, listen. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, which means counsel, with all long suffering. You're to do it, but you're to do it with pity, compassion, and long suffering. Paul preached with that long suffering. He said, I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Do you know that you're a pattern of his long suffering? Come on now, tell me it wasn't his long suffering that found you. How patient has he been with you? That, that's what God told me about television too. You know, last time I talked about television here, I did it with the tears in my eyes. I did it with a broken heart. And if I ever tell you again, God hates it, I'm going to tell it to you because I love you and I'm not trying to rail against you. But I, I've got to tell you right now, if it weren't for the long suffering of Jesus, I wouldn't be standing in this pulpit now. Folks, somewhere along the line, uh, I, I would have turned my back somehow, not on the Lord, but something would have crept in. My family would have been disintegrated and everything else, but for the long suffering. I stand here like Paul as a pattern of the patience and the long suffering of Jesus Christ. How long he bore with some of my foolishness. How long he put up with me. And yet he brought me back to this place and I stand now in his holy freedom. How patient he's been with you. Why will you not be patient with others then? Why will you not be patient with those that you deal with all around you? Now, truthfully, the love of Jesus never gives up on people. I want to show it to you, Revelation 3.15. Revelation 3.15. I'm not going to preach much longer. Revelation 3.15. You, you know this. He's talking about the Laodicean church. Don't you know that's the backslidden church? That's the harlot church? Look at verse... Revelation 3.15, the Lord is saying, And I know thy works, speaking to Laodicean church, that thou art neither cold nor hot, or would you either cold or hot? So then because you're lukewarm and not cold or hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth, because thou sayest thou art rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You don't know that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I'd look this way for just a minute, if you will, please. You, you see... Jesus standing at the door. Well, if I, would you just look at verse 20? He's already told me he's going to spew them out of his mouth, hasn't he? 
Now look what he said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Listen very closely to me now. It'd be easy. And I, I think there was a time in my ministry I could have stood in a pulpit and I, I, I would have said something like this. Look, there it is in black and white. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Folks, is it in your Bible? There it is. In black and white, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You're compromised, you're backsliding, you're naked, you're cold, you're lost, you're undone. And God said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And I had been preaching the truth halfway. Because look at verse 18. There's Jesus. He doesn't want them to be spewed out of his mouth. Look, he's counseled them. He said, please buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. He didn't want them to be poor in spirit. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He's trying to cover their shame. He's not trying to expose anything. He's trying to cover it by his blood. And anoint thine eyes with eyes salve that thou mayest see. And for as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. He's offering mercy. He's offering grace. And see, if I had just come and preached, I'll spew out of my mouth, I would have had Scripture to prove it. But I would not have preached Jesus in His fullness. I would have missed. Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Before I'll spew out of my mouth, I'm going to knock on your door. Because I really don't want to spew out my mouth. I want to sit down and eat with you. I don't want you standing naked before the world. I want you covered. But see, we give up on our weak brethren. If we're working with people and they fail us, especially after the second or the third time, it usually, I know it's, I've said it so many times, look, I've tried, I can't waste any more time. He doesn't want God. He knows why I'm at if he wants the Lord. I'll be here, but I'm not going out of my way. I don't think you're going to make it anyhow. Have you said that about your husband or your wife? I don't know what it's going to take. I've prayed and I'm tired of praying. Man, I've done everything I know how to do. There's nothing left. And most people, do. we just give up on people. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't. I'm so glad Jesus didn't give up on Peter. Peter didn't deny him once. He didn't deny him twice. He, didn't, he denied him three times. He cursed him. He said, I don't even know the man. I don't know him. He told me Satan was after me to try to sift me. He warned me. I heard the word, I was warned, and yet even in spite of the word that I heard, I've been sitting under this kind of ministry, and I went right out and I did something to grieve my Lord. How could I have done it? Does that sound familiar? Come on. Amen. Don't hide. The Holy Spirit knows where you're at. Oh, but Peter, Peter remembers something Jesus said. And I can, Peter says, oh, the look in his eyes, I'll never forget that look. What was that look? It was a look of love. Because Jesus said, Peter, <laughs> i got to read it to you. Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. You know what, Peter? You know what brought him back? I'm convinced of it. Peter's weeping over the hilltops. He's walking up and down the hillside of Judea and said, I've denied him. I've sinned. <laughs> I've grieved the Lord. I should have done it. I'm his servant. I've preached his gospel. I've laid hands on the sick. I let him down. Oh, but he said something to me. He said he's going to pray for me. He's praying for me. He's praying for me right now. He's praying for me. Do you know that he's doing that right now for you? And for me, he's before the Father. He's praying for us just like he prayed for Peter. And then Peter remembers something else. Jesus said... I'm going to be converted. I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to be an example to my brothers. Strengthen your brothers. I'm going to be an example of His grace. Can't you say that right now to yourself and to the devil and the whole world? Yes, I've grieved Him. I've sinned, but I hate it. I despise it. And I know He's interceding for me right now. And he's saying, you come back to me, and when you're converted, I'm going to make you stronger, and I'm going to use you. You're going to be a testimony to me and to your brothers. Hallelujah. 
What kind of love is that? I'm going to close in just a minute. Remember, remember the prodigal son who just took his belongings and went off and he wound up in a pig pen eating the husk of the pigs? You have been there? Far? Some of you are there. I, I have to close now, but this is where the Holy Spirit has brought me for tonight. Please hear me, and I don't... I'm not going to do it psychologically or sentimentally or anything else. But I ask the love of Jesus to make it real. Do you know that whole time that prodigal son was out there feeding the pigs? What was his father? His father was looking for him. Waiting for him. See, the Lord won't force himself on you. But he's waiting. All you have to do is like the prodigal son, come to the end of yourself. Say, look, I've had it. I can't carry this guilt, this condemnation. And more than that, my father has everything that I need. Do you know that father was praying for that son? According to the scripture, if you put everything else together, you you see the picture, composite picture. One day he gets up and he comes back. And that's what God wants you to do tonight. You're in the balcony here, down on the main floor. You have that burden on you. You've slipped away from the Lord. Your heart's grown cold. You're under condemnation and guilt. Lord said neither. To, he, he told the woman, I don't condemn you. Go sin no more. Well, your accusers. He's not your accuser tonight. He's your savior. He's your savior. So this, this boy gets up and he heads back home. And before he even gets there, his father sees him and runs after him. You know, the, that's Jesus. But he comes after you. you. take one step to him, and I mean he'll come to you. The father he brought to him says, You spit at me. Look at it. I told you it happened. I knew you'd do it. There was a streak in you. It's been there all the time. You're a brother. You're older brother. You ought to be like him. Stayed right here faithful. Well, that's not what he told him. What did he do? He fell on his neck and kissed him. He saw his dirty clothes, and he said to his servants, Take those clothes. Put new clothes on his back. Lord said, I'm going to make you a righteous person. I'm going to clean you up. Lord's master said, take off those filthy shoes. He put new shoes on him. And the, the, the boy said, but I'm not worthy. Master, Father, I failed you. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. I'm not worthy. In other words, Lord, let me stay out here till I work my way in. I've got to earn your respect now. No, the father said, right into the house. And he had a feast with him. Put on a feast. Why? Because the prodigal son could say, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. And I'm not worthy. And when you come to that place, then you come to the feast. He doesn't want you just camping outside. He wants you at his table tonight. Kill the fatted calf. And says, come on home. My son who is dead is alive again. Hallelujah. Some of you have been dead. God's going to resurrect you tonight. Hallelujah. Well, I told you it's very simple. Bow your heads. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Show us your love tonight. How you're reaching out in love tonight to say, if you'll get up out of your despair, if you just get up out of your flesh, get up out of this thing that has a hold of you, come to me. I'll receive you. I'll make you righteous. All you have to do is get up and come. Come home. Come home. Come home. Lord Jesus, I feel your love tonight for this people. Truly you love us. You love us with an undying love. Holy Spirit, just come and put your arms around the sinner here tonight. Put your arms around the backslider. Put your arms around those that are struggling with the weight, saying, I can't take it anymore. I, I'm bound by this thing and I want to be free and I don't know how to get free. Lord, put your arms around them and by your Spirit, just draw them. And tonight, break every chain that binds them and set them free. If God, by His Spirit's touched you tonight, and the Holy Spirit has said, this message is for you, and you've, you've been backslidden in heart, or you're carrying a load of sin or guilt or habit, and you say, brother, I want to come home.
learning how to love the Lord. Very simple message. Learning how to love the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the love of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you loved us first and you found us. Now, Lord, I pray for a special anointing of your Holy Spirit to be upon me, rest upon me, that the word of the Lord would come forth and produce life. Lord, only life produces life. And I pray that the life that you placed in me by your Holy Spirit would come forth and produce life in the heart and the ears of the hearer. Lord, we, we want to learn how to love you. We thought we knew how, Lord, but you examine us by your Spirit this morning to see if we have really learned how to love you. Lord, I pray for a revelation, a simple revelation to revolutionize our, our thinking about how we love Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your presence this morning. Cause your word to change our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I've always believed that Love is not something you say, but it's something you do. It's something you do. I've always believed that and I've preached that. And the Bible confirms uh, that with this following admonition. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. God says, don't love me with just your words. Don't just love me with your tongue. Show me your love by your deeds and your actions. Jesus reminded the Pharisees of the one great commandment. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. In fact, in Jude verse 21 we read, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, I, I, I would, if I were to ask you this morning, everyone in this auditorium that calls yourself by the name of Jesus. Do you really love Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength? Do you love him with everything in you? And the majority would say, well, I hope so, I think so, uh, the best I know, yes. Let's examine that in the light of the word this morning. I believe that most Christians really do want to love the Lord. I, I can't conceive how you'd want to follow Jesus without wanting to love him with everything in you. Can't even conceive that in the mind of somebody who says, I, I have been saved and the Lord has redeemed me. How could you want anything else in your life but to love him with everything in you? <clears throat> but you see, what we have done, especially in the past 10, 15 years, we have sentimentalized the love, our love for the Lord. We have equated our love for Jesus as human love. We have put it on that level. We've, we've tried to think of loving Jesus the way we'd love a husband or love a wife, and, and uh, we've got it down to feelings, we've got it down to emotions, and uh, we express very tearfully and very emotionally our love for Jesus. We, we go into the secret closet of prayer, we spend some quality time with him, and we cry and we pray, and we lift our voice and say, Lord, I love you. I adore you, I praise you, and we give them these great expressions of heartfelt love when we come out saying, this was a wonderful time of loving Jesus. I had a love session with my blessed Savior. And other times then we come to God's house as we did this morning, and we lift our hands to the Lord, and corporately we enter into praise, worship, and we sing such sentimental songs to him, sweet Jesus, uh, oh, how I love Jesus. Think of the words that we use, uh, very sentimental words in expressing our heart love for the Lord. Sweet Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, Jesus, lover of my soul. And we sang this more, more than ever before, Lord, I love you. Now, am I saying that that is wrong? No, I'm not. Am I saying it's wrong to be sentimental about Jesus? Is it wrong to have emotion? Is it wrong to have uh, great feelings of, of uh, human uh, emotion when we express our love to Jesus? No, not at all. Not at all, because if you turn to the Song of Solomon, you'll find very emotional, sentimental uh, words that we understand, loving words that the human mind understands, the kind of words we express between husband and wife and those who are deeply in love. 
No, I'm not saying that that is wrong, but it goes beyond sentiment. It goes beyond feeling. It goes beyond our emotion. There's something far beyond what we have really learned about loving Jesus. There's nothing more beautiful than Song of Solomon, especially these words. I sat down under a shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to his banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Now picture with me, if you will, every Sabbath, and especially, let's talk about today, and all over the world, millions and millions of believers are meeting in sanctuaries all over the world. Can, can you imagine what it would be like to hear one mass choir of these multiplied millions expressing their love for Jesus on any given Sabbath? Can you imagine how it would sound like absolute thunderous worship and thunderous love going up? It would be something that only angels could hear. And, and you would think that must be wonderful. How that must move the heart of the Lord. How the Heavenly Father must rejoice as he hears multitudes that have been redeemed loving his own son. It, how that must move the heart of God. How the angels must rejoice. Now some of you here this morning are not going to like what I'm about to say. And some of you say, well here he goes again. He always sees the negative of everything. But see, I want to teach this body how to truly love Jesus. I want to teach that this morning. Because the Holy Ghost has been teaching me and I'm a shepherd and that's my work, that's my calling to teach you uh, how to truly love Jesus with all your heart, your mind, soul, your body, and strength. <clears throat> now, you already know the scripture says you, that to love him is not in word and in tongue alone. That's part of it. But that's not, that's not the true parameters of love. That's not the manner in which the Lord himself is prescribed to love him. There's a grand song of the church that says, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing his praises. But I want you to know that my Lord Jesus filters every voice. He filters every song. He judges every prayer that comes as incense before his throne. He judges it. He filters it. He examines it. And sad to say, the majority of what ascends into the heavens, supposedly as incense, is rejected. In fact, I can prove to you, and I will in just a moment, that it, it, that it can be nothing but an abomination to his ears, and he will just spew it out. He will not, he will shut his ears to it. Remember Moses and Joshua coming down from the mountain because the children of Israel had erected an idol and they were singing and dancing around it and worshiping the idol. And God said to Moses, go, get you down, for thy people have corrupted themselves. Joshua and Moses are coming down from the mountain and they don't see the camp yet, but they're not even probably in eyesight, but they're in earshot. They hear it. And Joshua was the first to pick it up. He said, I hear the sound of the noise of war. They've either... Uh, been defeated and they're screaming in pain or they've had victory and they're shouting. Moses had a deserting ear. He said, no, 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 no. He said, that's not it, Joshua. It's not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is the voice of them that have been overcome. That's the noise of them. He calls it noise of them that sing, do I hear? He said, it's a strange noise. No music to his ears. Now, if a human, a mere human can discern and without even seeing and all of these sounds coming, he can discern that that's not worship, that's not the right sound. How much more our blessed Savior is able to discern the voices and the kind of uh, expressive songs that we sing, how he discerns what comes from our hearts. Without a doubt, every Sabbath, millions sing love songs to Jesus with great feeling and great emotion. But let me, let me show you something from the Word that I hope will once over all change how you think 
about how you love Jesus. Let me explain. Jesus said, in no uncertain terms, to love him is to hear and obey his commandments. In other words, it's impossible to love Jesus only with your words and your tongue. Impossible. It is something you do. It's something I do. Listen very closely to our Lord's description of what it means to love him. John 14, 15. If you love me, you keep my commandments. John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. John 14, 23. If a man love me, he will keep my words. Verse 24. He loveth me not, does not keep my sayings. He that is not loving me, or he's saying it's impossible to love me unless you keep my sayings, you keep my word. And here, it really nails it down, First John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Now, nothing could be more clear in the word of God. Love for the Lord goes beyond sentimentality. It goes beyond emotion, beyond our feelings, beyond our words, beyond our singing. Love for the Lord, as it's prescribed here by Jesus himself, is obedient to his, obedience to his every word. Obedience to his word. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide or live in my love. He said, do you want to really not just come to me with sessions of love, not just expressions of love, but do you want to live in love with me? Now, when I love my wife, it's not uh, a certain hour or a certain time, like coming to church for an hour and worshiping. I, it, it's a lifestyle. It, it's a, it's a 24 hour lifestyle. He said, if you want to live in love with me, if you want to live the love life with me, he said, even, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide or live in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. You find it all through the New Testament. You can't miss it. I was driving my car recently from New Jersey here into the city. And I this, this past week, and it was a busy week for me because I had jury duty. And, and of all things, they wanted to put me on a trial. Uh, they wanted me to be a, what do you call it? A, a juror on a case with a drug pusher. I told the judge, you got the wrong man. <laughs> so they dismissed me. But with jury duty and so busy this past week, I was driving in and, and I, was I was talking to the Lord. I said, oh Lord, I... I have not loved you this week like I should. I have not had the quality time that I need with you. And I feel so dry and empty in my love for you. And I, I, I was saying, oh God, I, I feel bad about it. Please forgive me for not loving you like I should this week. Because you know, I hadn't, had, I hadn't had that time to just lift my hands in his presence and just let the love words flow out of my heart. And I was feeling really cold and empty and dry and and I was apologizing to the Lord for it. And boy, the Spirit of God came on me. And the Lord said, wait a minute, David. Very clearly, he said, loving me has little to do with how much time you spend shut in with me in prayer. It has little to do with those deep feelings and expressions, even your tears or your promises or your songs. Loving me has everything to do with obeying me in your hunger and in your desire to know my commandments, to hear my word, to obey my word fully, that is to love me. If you seek me and by the help of the Holy Ghost to understand my word, and if you will pray for the Holy Ghost to give you ability and power and an enablement to keep my word, then you're loving me. And you know, it, it, it just dawned on me. I, I've spent so much time in my past life judging my fear, my love for Jesus by my emotions. I love him when I'm red hot. But when I'm down, I don't love him like I should. 
And the Lord said, that's not it. You're missing the point. You're missing it. You see, your feelings are no barometer for the love of Jesus. Not at all. You can be, you, you can feel in your emotions absolutely nothing. But if you're walking in total obedience to the word of the Lord through the power of the Holy Ghost, you're loving Jesus. David loved the Lord with all of his heart. I don't know anybody in Old Testament that expressed that love more than David. David said, oh, how I love thy law. I love thy commandments. I love them exceedingly. I love thy precepts. I love thy testimonies. You see, David understood the manner of love. He understood what God expected of him if he was to truly love him. With not just his love songs out on the hill as a shepherd with his little uh, harp. That, that was not love. It, it was his absolute respect for the law of God. Respect for the word of God. That's why he said, I, I love thy law. I love thy commandments. I love them exceedingly. Your precepts, I love your testimonies. No other saint in the Old Testament sang more love words and songs than did David. He said, I will sing, I will sing praises, I will sing aloud, I will sing with my heart, I will sing in the night, I will sing a new song, I will sing with the psaltery, I will sing of his mercy, I'll sing of his power, I'll sing, and he cries, I'll sing all, all the earth. He was a singer of love songs to the Lord. Yet David understood that all of his singing, all of his words, all of his, whether it's written or verbalized, had to come out of an obedient heart. He said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In spite of all my songs, my love songs, all my expressions of love, if I regard, and the word regard there means if I've made peace with my sin, if I've decided to live with it and live in this disobedience, God will not hear me. Now, not every act of disobedience cuts you off from God. Not every act of obedience shuts down your prayer or your, your love songs to Him. It's a commitment to a life of disobedience. It's having... Got to the place where it said, I will not give this up. I will live with my sin. I've made peace with it. There's no more conviction. I want nothing to do with being convicted. That will absolutely shut you off from the love of Jesus Christ. You cannot possibly love him. You cannot love him. Oh, his love for you is undying. His mercy is everlasting. But there's no possibility that you, you he could receive love from that kind of a heart. Psalms 28, 9, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. He said, you turn away from my word. You shall disrespect and dishonor, and you will not work this into your body and into your mind and soul. You will not live according to my word. He said, all your prayers are an abomination to me. When Israel was walking in disobedience, God sent Isaiah with these words, he said, when you spread forth your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not listen to them because you need to wash, make yourself clean and put away the evil of your doings and cease to do evil. He said, deal with your sin, obey my word. And folks, he didn't make us a commandment to obey his word without in the New Testament giving us all the power of the Holy Ghost we need to do what he told us to do. He didn't leave it up to us. That's the new covenant. David said of the deceitful person, let even his prayer become sin. Prayer become sin? Prayer an abomination? I had a young minister sit in my office, tears in his eyes. He just told me he, he had just come from his house and told his wife, didn't love her anymore and was leaving. Left his wife and children. I got my Bible out. I said, no, no, wait a minute. Before you go another step, I want to show you what the book says. I took him to Malachi. I took him through the word. I, I took him all through it of the 
of what, what God, how God sees it, what God has commanded, his responsibilities to his family, to his marriage, to his vows, went right through it. And suddenly I stopped because I realized he wasn't listening. He said, you don't understand, Brother Dave, I have total peace about this. God doesn't expect me to live in turmoil anymore. Our marriage has been a mess from the beginning. God doesn't expect it of me. And he said, I have peace. But he said, I want you to know, I still love the Lord with all my heart. He said, I determined three months ago to, to, to get out of this mess. And so I told her yesterday, and, and he, he said, I, I, all I want you to know, Pastor, is that in that three months, I've drawn so close to the Lord. I have wept more than I've ever wept, prayed more than I've ever prayed. I have peace about it. I know it's okay. And, and he, he said, uh, I intend from here on out to love Jesus as much or more than I've ever loved him in my life. Now, here's, here's a, a young minister who has soothed his feeling, his conscience by washing them with his crocodile tears. And he thinks that he's loving the Lord. He thinks the Lord is going to receive his offerings of love. He, he's going to go to church, raise his hand. He'll stand in the pulpit and preach about love or talk about it. But he's living in disobedience. So his prayer is sin. His praise is sin. His love is an abomination. Every word that he speaks, a waste that they don't get above the ceiling. Jesus began by saying, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is the love of He that hath my commandments. Now, what does that mean to have the commandments? It's not just to hear the commandments. It means he who has them engraved in his heart and mind, who meditates on them, who truly believes every word is the voice of God. Folks, this, this is Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. This is Jesus. Every word is the voice of the living God. If we don't have this, we have nothing to stand on. I was shocked when I, I, I was in jury duty, and, and they call about 100 people at a time in a room, and the lawyers question them, and a, a lawyer gets up before the whole group here, and he says, I want you to know, when the witnesses come in, they're going to take a Bible, and they're going to put their hand on the Bible, and he says, I want you to know that putting your hand on the Bible means no more than putting your hand on the daily news. And everybody laughed, and... Then, you know, there's a big thing. I, I looked around and said, I'm living in a country I don't even know anymore. I don't even recognize. Because just 50 years ago, when I was a young man, mm, <laughs> I always get trapped. <laughs> David, think before you speak. This word was honored in the courtroom. This word was honored in America. Now, I, they don't even know why they do it. But that's why we have no real justice. That's why we have a nation going into this great moral landslide because there's no respect, there's no honor for this word. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That word hid in Hebrew is to hoard. I have hoarded up the word of God so that when I face sin, when I face temptation, I have the word hidden in my heart. That's why we beg you, we beseech you, we plead with you to read and to study and get into this and pray, Holy Ghost, make it real. Hoard it up, build it up in your, hide it in your heart that I might not sin against you, O Lord. Let me stop for a minute and tell you why I believe uh, David was called by the Lord himself a man after his own heart. Has anybody in this building ever committed adultery and ordered the murder of the husband? Anybody here done that? And then take that dead man's wife, to take her as a wife and make her queen? No, 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 David sinned as hard as anybody in this country or, or, or in, this, in this building today has ever sinned. And yet God calls him a man after his own heart. How can that be? 
Let me tell you why. David was constantly meditating on the word. He was hoarding it. He studied it. And he knew that he had the law. He had the word of God that he could measure everything. And he lived in absolute terror for that year. And what a relief it must have been when the prophet came to him and said, you're the man. He knew it all the time. And he knew the word would come to him eventually. David lived, I know, that time in repentance. He, he, he lived in godly sorrow because the word was in his heart. How quick he was to repent when the word came to him. Listen to what David said. By thy word I am quickened. He said, when I'm about to die, I come back to life by the power of the word of God. He said, I delight myself in his statutes. I will not forget thy word, O Lord. And here's his heart. Listen to his heart. Lord, make me to go in the path of your commandments. For then do, therein do I delight. Take not the word of truth wholly out of my mouth, because I do love thy commandments. Listen to him. He says, oh God, when I'm going astray, make me to go in the right path of your commandments. I love your word. I love to be reproved by it. I believe that the test of real holiness is that a man loves to be reproved by the word of God. He's not afraid of it. He wants it. He desires godly reproof. I, I love to sit in a meeting where the sword of the Lord shows me an area that I didn't know. And suddenly he brings it to the surface. Thank God for that. Cutting knife of the Holy Ghost in his word. You may be sitting here thinking, Pastor Dave, there, there's some disobedience in my life. There's an area in my life that I'm failing the Lord and I, I don't want to be mouthing love songs and praise the Lord that are not acceptable. What am I going to do because I'm going through a battle, I'm going through a struggle. Is, is he not going to hear my cries and not going to accept my love until I get everything straight, until I got it all figured out? No. Not at all. And I want you to listen now, and this will bring encouragement to your heart. <clears throat> Let me tell you what God's looking for. It's the very thing he saw in David, and he's looking for another. It's a heart that simply and honestly reaches out and asks, Lord, help me to understand. I want to have he that hath my commandment. I want them in my heart. Folks, about two years ago, I read that scripture, and it so gripped me. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loved me. And I said, Lord, I don't know if I have your commandments. I don't know if I know them. You said he that has them. He that is hoarding them. He that has read them and understood them and praying for understanding. I said, Lord, I don't even know what you're asking. I don't know what all your commandments are. I know I'm to love my brother it's myself. I know I'm, I'm to be forgiving, and I listed a whole bunch of things. So I got a new Bible and a pen, and I said, I'm going to start math them, going through the New Testament, and I'm going to mark down every promise, I mean, every commandment, every statue of the Lord Jesus Christ that he's given. I'm going to memorize them, and I'm going to live by them fully. I didn't get halfway through Matthew till I got so discouraged. I, I found dozens and dozens halfway through Matthew. And all I succeeded in doing was laying a grievous burden on my back. I said, oh Lord, all of these, all of these things. No, no. He, he said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He said, my commandments are not grievous, but I was grieved. I, I was heavy laden. It wasn't an easy yoke. I thought, how in the world? And then it, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. He said, this is why I've been given to you. That's why I buy. Because he, he, he said, when you're brought before governors and magistrates, he said, you're going to be brought and you're going to be persecuted. He said, you don't even have to think what you're going to say because in that moment you need me, the Holy Ghost will be there and he'll put words in your mouth that are not even yours. You won't even have to premeditate. And the scripture says that the Holy Ghost, when he comes, he's going to lead us into all truth 
and bring to our remembrance all the words of Christ, all his commandments, all his statutes, every love commandment of Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. I don't have to have a tabulator up here. I don't have to have a list of rules or anything else. All I have to say, Lord, I want to obey you. Holy Ghost, speak to me. And when I first came to New York, we started winning drug addicts. And when I started teaching about the Holy Ghost, I asked one boy to stand up and tell me what the Holy Ghost meant to him after he heard my teaching. He said, well, best I can figure it out, Pastor. You know, they call the cops blue coats. The best I know is that when you get saved and you love Jesus, he puts a blue coat in your heart. And he stands up when you go to do bad and he says, stop. And he says, it's all right. He says, green light, go. <laughs> Folks, a Holy Ghost is a blue coat, a Holy Ghost cop. Hallelujah. But you see, there's such a lack of respect for the word of God. Let me give you an example. A young divorcee wrote, she said, my schizophrenic husband divorced me. Later I found out that he'd been molesting our little daughter and both of my son, our sons. He gave herpes to my daughter. She said, I have no family left. I have no support. I have to go on SSI. Now my oldest son has been hospitalized with mental illness. It's more than I can handle. So in my distress, in my stress, I started back smoking, drinking, and partying. She said, Pastor David, I'm so ashamed. I let my Lord down. I'm so scared because I failed him. Could you please pray for me? I want to tell you something. God is going to hear that woman's cry. You know why? Because the word has reminded her. The Lord has convicted her by the word of God. She feels a conviction. In fact, she's asked for it in a letter. She said, I asked. I, I want God to move on my heart. There's a desire. She's failed the Lord. There's disobedience. But her heart has turned to the Lord. She wants to obey God. And when she cries, God's going to hear her. But how different it is, this letter I received from a Pentecostal pastor's wife. She says, my husband left me. And five wonderful children, ages 3 to 17, after 19 years of marriage, he ran off to Mexico for a quickie divorce that was not legal. He moved to another city and started pastoring again with his new wife. In fact, he was quite successful by human standards. Ten years later to the day, he shows up at my door and asks me to go back with him. He'd left his other Woman, he said, since we were not legally divorced, we could live together now. So we started over, and he returned to the pulpit. After being together three and a half years, he got involved with a 20-year-old girl at the age of 54. He found her in church. He found both of his women in church. That's a sad commentary. I've seen young ladies walk in here, just eyes for guys. No eyes for Jesus, they have eyes for guys. He moved in with this 20-year-old girl and crushed me. He justified it by telling me, quote, God told me I'm not really married to you or the other girl. My husband is now in his 70s, and they found a spot in his brain is diagnosed as a brain tumor. His life is at stake. But Pastor Dave, my faith has been severely tested. Will you please, please pray for me? You see, he heard a voice. I'm going to tell you something. When you live in disobedience, you're going to hear voices loud and clear. Oh, it's clear. You hear clear voices, yes. And it's the devil himself. It's demonic powers. So you're okay. Everything's all right. Nobody hears clearer voices than those who are walking in disobedience. Here's a man, a pastor, who has no regard for the commandments of the Lord. He knows what God said about lust, about adultery, about divorce. Yet he's callous and he chases after his lust. Stands in the pulpit and preaches about the love of God. And believes that he's truly loving the Lord. God 
It's not heard a word. It's all wasted energy. The word says his commandments are not grievous. And what he's, what he's really saying, what I demand of you is not going to crush you. It's not more than you can bear. Not at all. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have told you. Hallelujah. Folks, walking in the Spirit is saying, Lord, I, I really want with all my heart to walk in obedience to you. I don't want to live in disobedience. I have an open heart. I, I don't know what you fully ask of me. I, I, I do know some things about it, but Holy Ghost, teach me. The Holy Ghost will never, ever refuse that kind of a cry. He'll never refuse the cry of a hungry heart. Teach me. Search me. Show me anything in my life that is even borders on disobedience, Lord. And then even I, if I feel that I'm too weak to fulfill it, I'm going to ask your Holy Ghost to come down and do the work you've been sent to do and give me the authority and the power to walk in obedience before the Lord. Hallelujah. The only way I can release the power of the Holy Spirit in my life to do what I'm talking to you about so that my love is acceptable to the Lord as I walk in obedience to him, the only way to release that that power of the Holy Ghost in my life is by faith alone. It's by, not by making promises, not by striving. It's by exercising faith in God's word. God said it. He will do what he said he would do. He sent the Holy Ghost. Do you think the Holy Ghost comes to abide in us to be a silent partner? That he would stand by when you cry and weep and not lift a finger to teach you, to lead you, comfort and guide you. That would be to call God a liar. I've read so many pitiful letters from people in, in, in the past months. My wife, you know, we, we're, we're going toward, as you know, nearly a million people on our mailing list and we, we get up to 50,000 letters a month at times. And uh, Gwen reads night and day, I mean, constantly, and then she'll hand me these letters. And I told her yesterday, I said, honey, I, this is incredible. These are Christians. The sorrow, the suffering, the, the crises, and, and some of them, it looks like the devil himself has come in and just uh, steamrolled over everybody. It just... It seems like there's no barriers. I said, I've never. We've been reading these letters now for, for many years, for 30 years. And, and in the past year, it has exploded. It's, it's mind boggling. In fact, there are times I just have to back away. I can't handle it. I don't know how Gwen does. I pray God keep her mind from, from being, uh, crushed by the burden of, of these letters. And yet the majority of them, there's one thing in common. It goes right through them. I, I grieve and I said, oh God, I, I can't believe the troubles, incredible troubles. But there's one thing, there's a thread that goes through in their time of crisis. When things are getting bad and trouble piles upon trouble, very few of them turn to the word. Very few of them go to the Holy Ghost for comfort. They, Either get bitter, they begin to murmur and to complain. They get on the telephone and they call everybody they know and try to commiserate with in, in their troubles. And I, I hear very little in the letters. I know I'm going through it. Things are bad. Things are difficult. But I know God's faithful. And this past week I've been into the word of the Lord and I've gotten a promise from the word. Very few of them would think about disobedience as being a part of the problem. Now, folks, I know, I know because I've studied Job. I know that all suffering is not a result of sin. That the righteous can suffer. And, and I'm going to read a letter to you, a heartbreaking letter in just a moment to prove just that. But I, I'm telling you, I don't care what you're going through. 
in your life, would you first check this matter of obedience? Has God spoken to you about something in your life that needs to be dealt with? I know what it's like when I was a young pastor. God was dealing in my life with about some things in my life. And I was in, I was in disobedience. And I, I, I knew there was something. I, I had some kind of inner knowledge that my prayers were not being effective. That I was wasting my words. Because God was waiting. said, no, wait a minute, David. You deal with this. You deal with this. I, I'm no respective person. You know... You're not special when it comes to obedience. Nobody is special when it comes to obeying God's word. He said, I expect it of you, expect it especially of you if you're going to maintain the anointing of the Holy Ghost on your life. The Lord made it clear that I could never, when I traveled as a young pastor, I could not turn on television and watch pornography. He said, if you do it one time, I just ripped it on and, and, and you know, that curiosity for a few moments. The Lord said, David, you keep it up, I'm going to take your anointing from you. You can't have the anointing and pollute your eyes. That's my word. You're not special. You must obey. I thank God he put his fear in my heart. By the fear of the Lord, men turn from their iniquities, the scripture says. And I thank God for that. But then there, that's first of all, check, check your... Your obedience. Lord, is there an area in my life? And go back. Let the Holy Ghost examine it, and then say, Lord, give me power to obey. If I have to go make something right, I want to make it right. I want to walk in obedience. I want to believe this word. And folks, get into this book. And when the Holy Ghost, become, when you come to something in this word that the Holy Ghost wants to do with you, he'll stop you at that point. He'll say, wait a minute. Read it again. He will speak to you. He will tell you. Hallelujah. The, the Holy Ghost has a voice. It's not just the conscience. The voice, the Holy Ghost has his own voice. Hallelujah. You may have seared your conscience. God will bypass that. He'll get right to the heart of it. He'll speak. How many have you ever had the Holy Ghost speak to you? How many have ever had the Holy Ghost say, that's wrong? How tender he is. How faithful he is to let us know where we feel God. That's why he's here. Why he abides and he comes. If you'll obey me, I'll give you the strength. If you, if you want that, even if you want the heart to obey me, I'll give you that heart. I'll take the heart of stone out of you. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll give you a heart. I will put my spirit in you. The scripture says that's the new covenant and I will cause you to walk in my ways. That's the prayer David had. Let me read to you a, a letter Gwen handed me last night, and I, I, I prayed about it. I'm going to call this uh, family this week. In fact, after I read this letter, you and I are going to stand. We're going to pray for this family. She said, Dear Brother Wilkerson, the following is an urgent request for prayer. Our daughter-in-law suffers from manic depression. If left untreated, at least uncontrollable suicidal compulsions is it caused by chemical imbalance in her brain. However, after 18 years, uh, uh, however, over 18 years ago, she quit taking her medication before she married my son, not telling him about her illness. She was afraid he wouldn't accept her. Her secret was exposed 15 months ago when she slashed both wrists and had to be taken to hospital for several, several weeks. The torment she'd gone through and the torment of my son and their children, what they went through is difficult to even impart. For several months after she was hospitalized, she seemed to be improving. But three months ago, she made another attempt at suicide. She hears a deep voice calling her name. And then it tells her how worthless she is and to take her own life. In spite of what the doctors say, we believe there are spirits involved in this. She's continued to lose ground. She's withdrawing more and more into her own needs and feelings. She has no concern now for her husband and children. She refuses to cook or clean. She has no quality time for them. My son says, Mom, this is not the woman I married. She's become another person. In addition to this, my grandson, age 15, their son has developed 
oppressive compulsive disorder. She admitted recently that our, 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 our daughter, our granddaughter admitted that two boys held her down in the school ground, choked her, and attempted to molest her. She held it inside because of fear and shame. She's only 12 years old. She's become manic depressive also. She sees nightmares now for the past two years. Insurance doesn't pay anything for mental illness now. All the benefits have run out and it's costing 700 a month. We're deeply in debt. My husband's retirement savings are all gone from trying to help. And she goes on, this whole family is in danger of being torn apart. This family is Christian. We have walked according to God's ways. We attend church regularly. <clears throat> My son continues to cry to God for help in spite of her illness. He deeply loves her and he loves the Lord. We attend an Assembly of God church and have done spiritual warfare on their behalf through all, all of this. However, with a few exceptions, we've been shocked at the response of Christian friends and the pastors and clergy. <clears throat> when uh, my daughter-in-law was in the hospital, the Lord told me to read the book of Job, and I was struck by the response of Job's comforters. They insisted his problem was sin. They suffered only with him a short time, and then they laid the whole burden of the circumstances at his feet. And many Christians have done that to us. They don't know how to deal with mental illness. Some were willing to pray at the start, but now they avoid us like the plague. If you don't get instant answers, they say, then it's your fault. We have never prayed so long and so hard for anything in our lives. We've come against demonic spirits. We've won some battles, but we haven't won the war yet. We know the word. and We stand on the promises of God. Our children cannot take any more. Brother Dave, we can't take much more. We are near the point of breaking. He said, we know the Lord Jesus is Lord. His name is greater than my trials. We cling to his love and belief for a miracle. But Brother Dave, we're suffering battle fatigue with even our own minds becoming stressed. We're even forgetful now ourselves. Please won't somebody stand with us against the evil trying to destroy our home. Please hold up our hands in this battle. Our lives are at stake. Please, somebody pray. Now, folks, you see, here's someone says, I stand on the word. In fact, some of these, some of the letters we get make Job's trial pale. Literally pale. Honestly, there's some things that are worse than the book of Job. But occasionally you hear this word from somebody. I know the word and I stand on it. We're going to stand and pray for this family. This family is from Washington State. And we're going to get in touch with this family tomorrow. And we're going to remind them that this whole congregation stood in prayer. That while we're praying for them, I want you to pray for these thousands and thousands of letters coming into this church of people suffering. And some of you in this congregation right now may be suffering. You, you, you said, Brother Wilson, I, I have battle fatigue. I am going through it. And I don't want to lose my love for Jesus. I want to be obedient in all my ways. But if you, you, you can stand here this morning and say, I know the best I know how. The Holy Ghost does not put anything, any finger on anything in my life. The best I know, my heart is open before the Lord. And I want him to undertake now. The Lord will do that this morning. I want us to stand, if you will. I want everybody to stand. Now, Here's what we're going to do. Up in the balcony, you can go to the stairs on either side and come down any aisle here in the main floor. I don't want anybody to come forward except those who are being ministered to and touched by the word of the Lord right now, this particular word. And you're saying, as you stand here before me now, Pastor David, you're describing me. I am going through... Uh, so many troubles. I have battle fatigue. I am weary. I'm tired of the battle. And if there's anything of disobedience, I want God to deal with it. But my heart is open for the Lord. Or you say, I, I don't know of anything in my life right now that would hinder God's work in my life. I know he loves me and I know I love him. But I need a touch. I need deliverance from this absolute harassment from hell. 
I want you to step out of your seat. Now, if you're not right with God, you can come. If you're not saved, if you're backslidden, you can come with these that are coming. This, this is open right now to everybody in this building. And after we have this invitation, I'm going to pray for this family. I'm going to ask you to join us and pray with this family and all the others that we, we, we promised that we would pray for if they would send their prayer request to this church. Well, we, we don't do that as a gimmick to raise money. Every Tuesday in our pastor's meeting, we lay hands on these boxes and we pray diligently over them. Our staff prays over them. We pray for them in an all-night prayer meeting. We pray for them on Thursday nights. But I want us to pray for those in this auditorium and those who have written to us. <clears throat> Obey the Holy Spirit. Come. Do they come forward? Look this way for just a moment before we go to prayer. You know, here's the temptation that I faced this week, uh, just being inundated with all of these problems and I said, Lord, these people are hurting so bad, going through so much trouble. How can I come with a reproving word? How, how can I add? I, I'll just be adding to their burden by, by coming down with the word, with the knife of the word. But I want to tell you something, folks. Listen to me. This is not some sentimental game. Sympathy is not what we need. We need truth. Only truth sets us free. See, no matter what you and I are going through, the word of God still stands. The word of God is still true. It's, it's outside of our problems. It's outside of our troubles. It's here to minister to us and life. And I'm telling you now, whatever, I, I tell you, you may be going through tremendous trouble, tremendous problems. Is it God saying something to you? Is God saying, are you willing to look at your life now? Are you willing to lay down your sin? Are you willing to obey me? What will you let me examine you and show you where the problem is? There can be a sin problem. I, I'm convinced the majority of the problems, marital problems, and all these other problems, are a result of sin, lust, disobedience to the Word of God. You've heard that, and you're going to hear more of it. That has to be dealt with. And the worst thing I could do is stand up here and try to just. Uh, hug you and uh, empathize with you and pity you and say, well, poor dear little saint, you're going through so much and pat you on the head. But if, if we bypass the root problem, I'm going to have to stand before God and answer it. I'm telling you now, with all the love in my heart, if you want to love Jesus, you say, I want to serve the Lord and love him with all my heart. Then you're going to have to stand right before his presence right now. Say, Lord, I know now that I can't love you unless I obey you. I have to obey your word. You say, I don't like that word. I have to do it. Oh, brother, sister, I thank God that he gave me his fear. He put his fear in my heart, the fear of the Lord. It was the beginning of all my wisdom. Will you right now open up your heart and say, Jesus, in this next week, send the Holy Ghost into my life. Because if you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost there to comfort and strengthen, and convict. When he comes, he said he'll convict of sin, righteousness and judgment. He'll warn you of the judgment on sin. He will lead you into the path of righteousness, but he will convict of sin. And then when you deal with that, then it opens up the door that the favor and the blessing of God can begin to work again in your heart. There are others of you standing here saying, oh, Brother Wilson, I, best I know, I, I am not walking in any disobedience, but I am, I am weary of a terrible battle struggle in my home or in my life. Would you believe that the Lord is faithful when he said, if you'll cast all those cares on you, I'll take them. I'll lift your burden right now. And if you'll go home all this next week and go into the book of Psalms and pray, Holy Ghost, minister life to me now. Speak to me through your word. He will lift every burden. You don't have to have it through sermons alone. You get it now through the word of the Lord and let this word be your life. You couldn't live without it. Neither can you. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of these that stand before me now. 
You know what's going on in their hearts. You know the struggle. You know the battle. You know the pain. And Lord, you also know the innermost thoughts. You know the innermost lust. The innermost desires. You know where the sin is. You know where that little black stone is that's embedded in the heart. And you're going to dig it out so that there be nothing hinder the flow of your blessing and the anointing of your spirit. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Just look up to him. Jesus. Come on from your heart. Jesus. I want nothing in my heart. No disobedience. No rebellion. I want your word. I want to know your word. And I want to walk in your word. I want to love your word. Like David did. Oh Jesus. Forgive my sin. Put your finger on it. By the power of your spirit. And then give me power. To make the confessions. That I have to make. To make restitution. To make changes. To do whatever you tell me to do. Let me walk. In the light of your word. Cleanse me Jesus. And deliver me now. From the attack of Satan. Now I.